Today, we're taking resin 3D prints and we're coating them in metal. We're doing that because it essentially doubles the ultimate strength of these prints and significantly improves the stiffness while we're at it. Resin 3D printers are fantastic, in my opinion, and not just for printing miniatures like most people think of. They're really good at functional parts. They print relatively quickly, you can get excellent detail, and they can hold pretty tight tolerances if you have the support set up correctly. But unfortunately, the resin that's typically used in these printers is notoriously brittle. It breaks very easily, and it isn't particularly strong. There are ways around this. You can mix in so-called tough resin to make it a little more elastic and a little less brittle. But at the end of the day, the resin used in these printers is just always going to be a different mechanical property from FDM prints like PLA. Ever since the Microlattice project, I've been enamored with the idea of plating these prints in different types of metals and seeing how it would affect the mechanical properties. Just anecdotally playing with those lattices, they felt much stronger than they really should for such a thin layer of metal that was placed on top. If you look around, there are papers that talk about this process and even companies that do this professionally to plate plastic parts and improve their mechanical properties. Just like the micro lattice project, we coat our prints in a conductive layer of paint. In this case, we're using the same graphite acrylic kind of ink that we used last time. I'll touch on this more at the end because there are some gotchas to this sort of process, which really comes out in the mechanical testing. To collect the data for these metal platings, we'll be using a universal test machine. You've probably seen this test over at CNC Kitchen, where he's done tons of different tests on various filaments. And then to calculate the strain or how much the kind of piece deforms axially, we're using an optical method known as digital image correlation. And essentially, all this does is it takes a high-speed camera and watches the test coupon to see how much it stretches. Digital image correlation is remarkably straightforward. You take a blank coupon like this, which is coated black, and then you spray a very fine speckle pattern over the front of it, which is some white spray paint. And what this does is it gives the machine vision algorithm small patches to track. And so as the speckle pattern moves and distorts and stretches, the software can monitor subsets of the speckle pattern and see how they move. And from that, it can calculate both displacement of kind of the test sample, as well as a virtual strain all across the whole test sample. This is really powerful because you can not only calculate the overall strain of the you know, the test, you can also see strain at individual points across the test sample. For coupons like this, it's not terribly interesting because it should be relatively uniform as it's being stretched, but you can imagine if you have a odd shaped sample or you're doing something like a bending test where you have differential stresses in different places or maybe around features, you can start to see stress concentrations show up at different locations. So it's a really powerful technique and it really is as simple as just spray painting some white and black speckles onto something and filming it at high speed. Right, so here's an example of analyzing a test run. In the center is the original footage. In this case, it's a piece of uncoated PLA. And then on either side, you can see two different charts that are derived from the digital image correlation software. On the right is the displacement chart, which shows how much different parts of the test coupon move. And on the left is a virtual strain map of the sample. This is done by looking at a specific point and comparing this displacement of that point to all of its neighbors. And from that, you can generate a kind of local amount of strain. And when you repeat that across all the samples, you get this strain map. Using the calculated strain values from the software and the stress values that we get off the load cell, we can put together a stress strain curve. And this shows a couple interesting properties. In particular, the ultimate tensile strength is something we're interested in. Basically, the point at which the test sample breaks and if you take the slope of this line, that gives you the Young's modulus or the modulus of elasticity. And that's in effect how stiff the sample is, how much it resists elongation. The values that we see here, I think are pretty representative of PLA, or at least in the, the right ballpark. There's a lot of software offerings out there for digital image correlation. A lot of them are professional packages and potentially very expensive, but I did find a really good piece of software called Dice, which is entirely free and open source. You can get it off GitHub and it worked great for me and it was very easy to use. 
So here's a quick rundown of how the software works. You load up your test sample images, select a region of interest to generate kind of these small subsets for the algorithm to track. And then this is an optional step, but you can also add in virtual test points, which will show you a live plot from those points. Uh, it's good for diagnostic purposes, and then it also makes my life easier for post-processing because we can extract those two virtual points independently. From there, you just hit run, let it crunch through all the numbers, and you'll get your displacement and strain charts generated. This dumps it out to a variety of different file formats. One of those formats you can load in a piece of software called Paraview. I'm not super familiar with Paraview, so I don't want to talk about it too much, but it's a scientific computing visualization software, and I used it to generate the real-time stress and strain maps over the sample. There's probably a way to extract the information I want out of Paraview, but like I said, I don't know it very well. So instead, for the actual stress strain curves, I did a more manual process. I took the strain data from the load cell, dumped that into a temporary file, wrote a quick Python script, which loads up the two virtual strain points, as well as the stress data, does a little bit of interpolation because the number of samples don't match in this case, and then spits out a stress strain table in effect. That goes into a second spreadsheet, and from there we can actually plot the stress and strain over time, as well as get properties like the modulus and ultimate tensile strength. I was originally going to show all of the real-time rendered stress and strain maps next to the original sample data, but unfortunately it's just not very interesting. The SLA in particular is so brittle that you don't see anything happening until it breaks. So we'll skip over looking at that and we'll just look at the compiled data and see some of the trends that came out of this experiment. So before we get started, a grain of salt here, I wouldn't trust the absolute values that were being presented too much. They might be accurate, they might not. It's hard for me to know how well I calibrated my machine or the load cell or the Arduino code that's running this whole thing. So the absolute values might be off, but I do feel pretty confident about the relative differences between the tests. With that being said, we can see the SLA resin by itself comes in around 15 or 16 megapascals, which is a little on the low end for resin, but the electroplated versions, both copper and nickel, nearly doubles that up to about 25 to 30 megapascals. The error bars are a little larger than I would like, and I think this is from a few different factors that we'll talk about later, and some mechanical issues that I'm still sorting out of my machine. And in this chart, we can see the modulus of elasticity, essentially how stiff the samples are, and the nickel coating blows the other two out of the water. It makes the coating a lot stiffer, and I very much trust this result because anecdotally, they feel a lot stiffer, and this is also perfectly in line with what the literature and what companies do in practice. Nickel is known to drastically increase the stiffness of samples, and that's what we see here. And then we can go ahead and plot these out. I took the most conservative example from each of the different data sets, just so that I wasn't accidentally trying to oversell this. And you can see that the SLA and copper-coated SLA are roughly the similar in stiffness, while the nickel is considerably stiffer. There's also a curious effect where the copper-coated sample has an increased elongation. I have to admit I don't understand how this could happen in practice. If the resin just naturally breaks when it elongates past a certain point, I don't see how adding a layer on top of the resin could increase that elongation without a failure happening underneath the coating first, and I didn't see that in the test samples. So this might just be a little bit of noise and measurement. I did want to repeat all of these experiments with PLA. Unfortunately, I ran into some issues with the adhesion of the electroplated layer to the print. And you can see here where the plating fails before the PLA itself fails. And this is problematic because what ends up happening is the electroplated coating becomes detached from the PLA and essentially just forms a shell around the test coupon. And because we're using an optical method to measure the strain, the external shell that has the speckle pattern is no longer moving because it's detached from the PLA. So all of our strain measurements are completely garbage at this point. 
this was such a rampant issue that I, I have essentially no data for the PLA test coupons. We'll need to revisit this with better forms of adhesion between the plating and the part to get some useful data. And just for fun, you can see what the stress strain curve looks like, and it's obviously no good. <laughs> you can see here where the plating fails, and then from that point on, essentially the speckle pattern stops moving, and so there's no more strain, but obviously the stress is increasing still on the load cell because the PLA is being pulled, and so we just get a completely useless set of data. Now, there are some real downsides to this process. For one, it's kind of tedious. There's a multi-step process. You have to coat things and then electroplate things and it takes a long time. There are logistical difficulties like ensuring a nice even coverage of plating all over your surface. For something like a test coupon, it's pretty straightforward because it's all flat, but for very complicated shapes like the lattices that we saw in the earlier project, it's difficult to get an even amount of metal depositing everywhere. And that can lead to surprising stress concentrations, probably where you don't want them. There is electroless plating, which guarantees a nice even coverage across the whole surface because it doesn't actually use electricity, but it has its own problems too. It's not super easy to do with plastic, it requires extra steps to like sensitize the plastic. Uh, and the deposit itself is both thin and really highly stressed. Someone told me that the electroless plating is almost like glass in how brittle it is. And so electroless can definitely alter the mechanical properties, but it's not a cure-all because it has its own very particular mechanical properties. One of the largest issues is adhesion, and that's the adhesion between the print and the plating. So getting a good strong bond between the plating to the conductive material and the conductive material to the print is critical. And clearly my graphite acrylic mix is not up to the task. And that could be because the print wasn't clean, I didn't really do a very good job cleaning it, or it could just be it's not a very strong bond in general. One of my viewers recently recommended different conductive sprays, carbon and a copper silver spray, which are apparently bond to plastics much better. So I'll be revisiting this topic with FDM prints once I get a hold of some of those sprays. Another problem, and one that I honestly wasn't expecting, is thermal expansion issues. So plastic and metal have very different thermal expansion, which you kind of intuitively understand but I didn't think it'd be as big of a deal as it turned out to be. So I don't know if you can see it, but I can see my breath right now because it's really cold in my shop. When I was testing these samples, I brought out a bunch and just set them on my bench to do one after the next. And I heard this like gentle tinkling sound and it took me a while to figure out what it was, but eventually I realized it was the metal cooling down at a faster rate than the plastic. And the tinkling was the plating separating from the underlying plastic. And indeed, when I tried a few of the samples that were tinkling, they had very different mechanical properties than the ones that were at a homogeneous temperature when my shop was a little warmer. So thermal expansion issues is a real concern with a metal plastic hybrid. And it really kind of goes back to the adhesion issue I mentioned before, where adhesion is important to keep the metal in place and thermal expansion can make it worse. There are a ton of other electroplating recipes that I'd like to try as well. In addition to copper and nickel, there's other metals like iron and tin, as well as binary alloys, so to speak, like nickel iron. Uh, I think these would be all really interesting to see how they affect the mechanical properties of prints, as well as some interesting literature showing how you can co-deposit inert particles into the plating while it's plating to really change the mechanical properties. So you could include ceramic particles or diamond particles or carbon fibers to really change the micro hardness or tensile strength. I think this whole topic is just endlessly fascinating and there are tons of different things to explore. If you find this interesting as well and you think I've earned your subscription, I'd really appreciate it. Okay, well, my propane heater is officially out of propane. There's a big snowstorm on the way and it's really cold in here. So I think we're gonna wrap it up for today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Resin 3D printers would be great for functional parts, except for one problem. The resins are usually... Ah, that was remarkably hard. Fuck.